Hello, God bless you. I'm going to open up a prayer real quick, and then we'll get started with tonight's Bible study. Heavenly Father, I come before you this night. God, I just want to thank you for another day of life. Thank you for waking us up this morning. God, thank you for all the things that you're doing in our lives. I thank you, God, for all the people who come across this video, God, and listen to this uh, uh, topic that I'm going to be going over tonight, God, about how a father leads and how a father should make a godly impact in their children's lives. I pray that... Um, this message will speak to everybody who comes across it, God, uh, man, woman, it doesn't matter. Whoever comes across this video, God, I pray that this message will speak to them, and it will always be your words and never mine. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. So um, give a shout-out to my son real quick. He he designed that overlay that you saw um, at the beginning of this video. Um, tonight, the title of this message is, you know, a father leads, make a godly impact, you know, in our children's lives, you know. Obviously, this Bible study is going to be a little different tonight. As you can see, I've got, you know, running across uh, the bottom there, you know, my today's my dad's birthday. He would have been 70 years old. And this, this Bible study, this message that I have for you uh, tonight is something I've been sitting on since Father's Day, okay? I prepared this before Father's Day, and I was going to put it up on my channel, but for some reason I never did. And um, on the way to work this morning, it was a very emotional morning. Um, I woke up, you know, I opened up my phone, I went to Facebook, and the first thing I saw was a picture of my dad, you know, and I believe it was my wife uh, making it. She made a post for him late last night, I guess, um, when I was already asleep early this morning, um, uh, you know, saying happy birthday to him. And it was the first thing I saw, and it was a very emotional morning. I drove to work in silence in my car. And um, I got to work and I started listening to some of his favorite songs and uh, I just broke down and cried. And I haven't cried in a while. And I just started crying, you know, there in my car before I went in and clocked in. You know, my dad loved oldies. My dad loved oldies, you know. So I was listening to, you know, the Drifters. I was listening to the Shy Lights. I was listening to the Tokens. I was listening to... Um, um, Spiral Staircase, you know, that song that he... Um, I love you more today than yesterday. He dedicated that song to Faith when they were, when she was a little girl, and that was always their song. So I was listening to, to all these songs, and I just got real emotional. So, you know, God told me, you know, it's time to give this message, you know, because, uh, you know, I didn't do it for Father's Day, and, you know, it's my dad's birthday, and, you know, I want to do a Father's Day type message, but I encourage you ladies to listen because it's for everyone, and we all can learn something from this. I know it's going to be different. I'm going to talk a lot about my dad tonight because I like to give personal examples. And, um, uh, and of course, I'm going to, you know, when my dad passed away, I said, I'm never going to let anybody forget about you. And I've, I've kept that promise, you know, two and a half years only, but you know, I've kept that promise. I told my dad, no one's ever going to forget the name Arthur Benitez Jr. Um, you know, I will keep your name going until the day I die, then my son will keep our names going, you know, until, you know, you know the way things are going, I think God will come back by then. Um, uh, so, yes, this Bible study is going to have a Father's Day type of feel to it, but I uh, encourage you, all you to listen, even you ladies. Um, so it's a title the Father Leads, you know, so a father should definitely lead, and a father should make an impact. I always talk about how my father made an impact. When he passed away, the word that came to mind was impact. I've said it all throughout, you know, the past two and a half years. You know, I believe I said it at his, at his, you know, celebration of life service. I've said it a lot. The word that came to mind was impact in all capital letters because my dad loved to type in ca all caps, not because he was yelling. And it made a lot of people mad, you know. My dad made a lot of people. It's amazing what people get mad about on Facebook. Why are you yelling? People would, would tell him. And he's like, what are you talking about? He didn't understand the lingo on here and all that stuff. Um, and neither did any of us. You know, he just didn't know how to, you know, he didn't know how to press, you know, cap lock and all that stuff and turn it off. It was honest to God true, you know. So he typed in all caps. And then maybe he did do it on purpose after a while once he knew. But, you know, impact in all capital letters. My dad made an impact, you know. Uh, he was a he was he got saved um, right before he turned 28, and uh, he passed away at 67. So for 39 years, he made an impact. 
He made an impact in men's life. He made an impact in my life, my sister's life. You know, he made an impact in so many lives. Him and my mother involved in marriage ministry also. But my dad's niche, he would he his his thing was men's ministry. Men's ministry. And he made an impact. You know, um, so impact, you know, a father must lead and a father must make an impact. But what kind of impact? A godly impact, obviously, you know, because that's the only impact that matters. You know, you, you, um, many children may have great memories of their father, but it's a godly impact that matters. You know, you know, you may be, you know, a great father. Your children, you know, have nothing but great things to say about you. But if you're not. If you're not making a godly impact, if you're not leading them in the things of God, you're not doing anything for them. That's just that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Um, my I, and the example I use is my father didn't leave me a dime. Okay, my father didn't leave me a dime. This has been a, an off and on topic that's come up, you know, on Facebook, all other posts, not with anybody I know, but like you know, you know. That, that scripture, you know, about leaving an inheritance to your children in Proverbs. I can't think of where it's found at the moment. Um, but the scripture on, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, a man should leave an inheritance to his children, obviously talking about money. Um, and I've always said, you know, yeah, that's, that, that's obviously that's great. But what's always bothered me is when people twist that just for the money side of it. Um, you know, obviously there's nothing wrong with the scripture. Don't get me wrong there, but it irks me when people take that scripture and twist it as in, you know, oh, a godly man or whatever, you know, a wise man leaves me here. Like they just focus on the money side of it. And my father left me so much more than money. He left me, you know, he left me so much more than what, than what money can buy. You know, he didn't leave me, you know, an inheritance like that, you know, but he left, he made such an impact and he led me his whole life that he left me in great hands. He he left me prepared. He left me prepared to, to go on without him, even though, you know, you don't feel like you're prepared. It's two and a half years and, you know, it still feels like yesterday and it still feels, you know, you still like you miss him so much. Um, but he left me prepared and it shows because look at where I am today. Two and a half years later, I have only, I have only grown from it. Through all the tears, through all the pain, through all the heartache, through all the devastation, I've only grown in my walk with God. So He's He's left me prepared. And if He would have left me unprepared spiritually, but prepared phys uh, met us um, monetarily, what good that would would that have done me? You know, that would have done me no good. I'll take the spiritual inheritance over the monetary inheritance any day. And I'm not knocking, you know, money and all that stuff. I'm just saying we need to focus on the right things, okay? You know, we need to focus on the right things. It's not what you leave your children um, with money-wise. It's what you leave with them spiritual-wise, spirit, spiritual, spiritual wise, you know? Um, my father left me prepared spiritually. That's why I'm sitting here today talking to you about my father and not drunk not you know um you know so devastated and, and destroyed over the loss of my father that i resorted to becoming an alcoholic again to to going off the deep end and backsliding and walking away like so many do unfortunately and it's not always it's not always you know the father's fault they left them they left them prepared but it's a personal choice you know that so, so many make where they just throw in the towel they blame god and you know they're upset with God because their, their, their father passed away, their mother passed away. It wasn't fair. It wasn't right. And, you know, unfortunately, so many, so many go down that road. And thankfully, I didn't because I was already on that road. I was just coming out of that road of alcohol and not following God. So I just came back. And then all this happened. And I, and I stayed. I stayed on the path that God placed me on right before my father was going to pass away. So the first scripture, you know, this Bible study is different. I don't got a lot of notes. I don't got a lot of scriptures, but I'm just going to be talking about my father. And, and you know, this is a Father's Day type Bible study. The first scripture I want to talk about is Proverbs 20, verse 7. The righteous who walks in his integrity. The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. 
but righteous who walks in his integrity. We need to walk in our integrity, man, and blessed are his children after him. We need to walk in our integrity. And, you know, I always talk about this. It doesn't make us perfect. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect father. No such thing. The world's greatest dad is still flawed. You know, everyone's got world's greatest dad shirts and hats that they've made, that they've bought for their dad. You know, everybody, myself included. You know, the world's greatest dad is still flawed. But we need to walk in our integrity, man, and our children will be blessed after us. We need to walk in our integrity. Um, righteous, a person or conduct, morally right, morally right or justifiable, virtuous. These are the you know, definitions of the word righteous. The, uh, the Merriam-Webster the Merriam Dictionary defines integrity. It says the quality or state of being Complete or undivided. Complete or undivided. That's integrity. Okay, it's in the dictionary. It says uh, the definition of integrity states the quality or state of being complete or undivided. Undivided. Let's, let's focus on that scripture for a second. That, that verse for a second. That, that word for a second. I'm all tongue tied right now. I just got home from work and I'm just like, you know, I'm just, I'm just going. So undivided. Undivided. Okay. Let's focus on that word for a moment. What does scripture teach us about being double-minded? James 1.8 says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I know that all too well because for many years I was extremely double-minded. I was, I was divided. It says we need to be complete or undivided. Well, I was very divided. I was a double minded man and I was extremely unstable and unfortunately my son saw a lot of this my son saw a lot of this this is where I this is where I um uncover myself and expose myself and you know let you in to my testimony um and show you that I'm not perfect and and man have I screwed up I screwed up so much something that my father never did. See, my father was an alcoholic up until, among other things, he was an alcoholic, um, a womanizer, um, up until he got saved. And he was one of those people who, he was almost 28, it was like two months before his 28th birthday, he got saved, went home, threw everything away, threw out all his booze, threw out all his, threw out everything, you know? And he had one of those like immediate, you know, conversions and transformations where, you know, he wasn't, obviously he wasn't perfect, but he got rid of everything he was dealing with. He got rid of everything. He was, he was on fire from day one. And then he went, he met my mom, you know, like a year later, they were married. God changed the whole trajectory of his life overnight, you know, and you know, a man who never wanted to get married and have children now was married and starting to have a family. He was a baby Christian still, one year, two year in, three years in. All the, and all his life was just the trajectory of his life was just trans was just God snapped his fingers and changed the whole trajectory of his life instantly like that. You know, um, he dealt with things early on, but he got over them. He got over them. You know, like King David. Made mistakes, but didn't make the same mistake twice, and kept moving forward. That was my father, and uh, you know he didn't he didn't deal with things long. He got he 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 had what what we consider a pretty much a an immediate transformation, and his whole life was changed. And he never showed me, but he always told me. That's the thing. My father never showed me. But he always told me about how he was because he wanted me to understand. He felt it was important that I that I knew how he was but never saw that side of him so that I could basically see the transformation from, wow, I can never imagine you cussing, Dad. I can never imagine you being drunk. I can never imagine you being a womanizer. I can never imagine any of those things. And that was the testimony. It showed what God can do to someone when he gets a hold of that person, how he can completely change their nature and, and, and their behavior and the things that were normal to them are now 
so far like removed from them you know so that was a testimony i never saw that side of my dad here's where i screwed up i showed my son and it pains me to say these things because i didn't learn it from my father and i should have never done it you can't take back the past right my son has seen me trying to hide alcohol from him when i went through my my alcohol days you know, I, I started drinking. It was a social thing. You know, I just, I, I can't even blame the people. Now, it's not like I was, it's not like it was peer pressure. I wasn't, I wasn't forced to drink. I just made a decision in that moment. Why not? You know, I was, I was, I was, I was hanging out and I just started drinking. You know, I just went, everybody was drinking and I just went along with it. You know, nobody forced me. There was, there was no peer pressure. I just made a decision and I always say, this is not a good thing, but I was what you call a happy drunk. I was a happy drunk. You know, everybody handles alcohol different. Some people need to stay away from it because they become awful. They become violent. They become, you know, all sorts of things. And some people, unfortunately, like me, are a happy drunk, meaning it lightened me up. I'm a very, I'm a very, what's the word? What's the word? Um... I'm very, oh shoot, I, I've used the word before and my mind went blank, but I'm very um, uptight. I'm a very uptight person, very uptight. My family knows how uptight I am. You may be surprised to hear that. I'm extremely uptight, not as like I was, but, but I was extremely uptight and alcohol made me extremely comfortable. It calmed me down. I was, I mean, I'm naturally funny and the life of the party and, you know, but I have different sides to me. I have different sides to me and I guess you could say I have several different personalities, uh, but I'm not diagnosed with anything, <laughs> but um, uh, so it calmed me down, made me very relaxed and I enjoyed the way it made me feel, which is not a good thing. And so obviously nobody was going to stop me from drinking because I was fun to be around when I was, when I was drunk. Um, and then years, years later after it, it wasn't a social thing no more. It was just something, it was an escape. It was an escape, something for like a Friday night, a Saturday night, you know, the week's over, my long week is over, I'm just going to, I'm just going to drink. And I always waited for my son to go to bed, but he knew what I was hiding in the trunk. He knew what I was hiding in that bag, and it, and it always made me uncomfortable. It always made me uncomfortable that he knew. And, you know, why do I say these things? I don't have to say these things. I don't. I, I hate that I'm having it, that I that I that I am saying these things because I hate that I that it's true. But I'm saying these things because it may help someone. It may help a man. It may help a woman. It may help a woman. I know it's a father's thing, but I encourage you ladies to watch from the start, and I hope you still are. You know, this may encourage somebody who's struggling with alcohol that it can be done. You can you can you can conquer this with the help of God with the help of God, not on our own, but with the help of God. So I say these things and expose myself because no, I can't help nobody by lying. I can't help nobody by lying and putting up a front like I'm this perfect, perfect guy who pops on your Facebook and your YouTube and has a Bible study, you know, twice a week, sometimes more, like a guy who has no life and just sits in front of his computer talking to himself. You know, I'm not this perfect guy. You know, I... I expose myself to help someone. And it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable. I, I hate that, that you're hearing this. But I'm telling you because I love you enough to, to, to help you. Like I, like I tell the guys at the ranch, hey, I'm never talking at you. I'm always talking to myself first. You know, I don't really have to tell them anymore because they know me by now. But early on, I'd be like, oh, just by the way, I'm just getting worked up because I get worked up. I'm not yelling at you. I'm just fired up you know i'm fired up i'm fired up you know and and they get me and that's that's why i love the ranch because i don't i don't worry about what what they're thinking they they get me after two years and they, they know that i don't drive two hours to and from four hours round trip i don't do that because i don't love them i love those men at the ranch i drive now four hours round trip to speak to them twice a month so I don't I don't drive up there to, to sugarcoat. I drive up there to keep it real, to keep it 100, and 
they appreciate that and they know where I'm coming from. So we we're talking about double-minded, right? James 1 8. And how we as men, we need, because I am I'm mainly speaking to men tonight. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not lying. I'm gonna speak to men mainly, but to everybody, but Scripture teaches us that the double-minded man is un is unstable in all his ways. James one eight. So we cannot be double-minded men. We have to be single-minded. We have to be. We have to be undivided, complete and undivided. Our attention cannot be divided. We have to be single-minded, focused on God only. Doesn't mean we're perfect. Don't feel bad because you're perfect. Uh, and you're not perfect. Don't feel bad because, you know, you, you're dealing with this, you're dealing with that. It's how you deal with it. We're all dealing with things. But it's how you deal with it. Do you let it defeat? Are you constantly tripping over it? Or are you, are you pushing through? Are you pushing through? Are you making progress? Or are you making the same mistake a hundred times? Now, if you've made the same mistake a hundred times, Repent and stop. It's not easy, but it is that simple. Or is it the other way around? You know, I'm not saying it's easy, but it is that simple. Stop making the same mistakes. Start showing your children that you are undivided. Your focus is 100% on God. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you've already done. All that matters is what you, you, you draw a line in the sand, you, you mark this day, and you go, hey, from this day forward, I'm going to show my children a different father. And that's what I did, you know? And now the testimony with me is now my son sees the, the difference in me. I still hate that he had to see that. I mean, he never saw me drunk. He never saw me incapacitated like that. I waited for him to go to sleep, but he knew what I was doing. He knew what I was doing at that innocent age. And that was bad enough. That was bad enough. And he saw my bad attitude. He saw how awful of an attitude I had. And now he sees how much I've changed. He doesn't see dad sneaking in alcohol no more. He doesn't. He sees dad thinking before he overreacts, thinking about it before he gets angry about something and apologizing when I lose my cool over something. I wasn't really mad at you, Sammy. I was just, it was something else. And I'm sorry for you seeing that. I will, I'm sorry for you seeing me lose my cool for a moment. But I don't lose my cool much anymore. I don't lose my cool behind the wheel. I don't lose my cool at home anymore as much, you know. And when I do those, those, those few slip-ups, I have to go and apologize and say, I'm sorry you saw me get angry. So we got to, we, we, we make, we make a decision and we say enough's enough. I'm not going to do this no more. I'm not going to deal with this no more. I'm going to fight. I'm going to show my children a new me, a new father. You know, conversely, the man who is single-minded and confident in the promises of God has clarity of thought. Okay. So we're unstable. In all our ways, we were double-minded. But when we're single-minded, now we have clarity. We have clarity of thought and great stability. Being obedient to one master, right? Matthew 6, 24 talks about how you can't serve two masters. You're either going to hate the one and love the other. You know, rather than serving two or three, displays to children the concept of loyalty and obedience. True leadership is having the integrity to practice what you preach and what you say and do what you say you will do. So, you know, practice what you preach and do what you say you're going to do. So don't tell your kids. We all know the cliche story of, you know, um, we saw it in the movie Courageous, right, when they're having the barbecue and they're talking about their fathers. And the one guy says, man, you know, my, my dad, you know, he made a comment about his dad. And the other guy goes, what? What did you say about your dad? Wasn't he like a deacon? in the church wasn't he like a head usher you know and he goes yeah but as soon as you know the, the service started he'd slip outside and, and and have a cigarette he'd slip outside you know you know my dad told me never drink i know i better never catch you drinking a day in your life you know he said it to me while he had a beer in his hand you know we all hear those cliche you know we, we know that cliche example right you know 
we have to practice what we preach and do what we say we're going to do. So we can't be saying one thing and showing our children another. And like I said, if you've been doing that, that's when you make the decision to stop now. God erases your past. The enemy, the enemy will never forget your past, and he'll constantly remind you. He'll place those thoughts. I, I've been dealing with it a lot lately. I've been dealing with it a lot lately. The enemy has been has been really working double time. Ah, no, I take that back. He's working triple time because he's always working double time, and he's working triple time. He'll remind you, like he's he's he reminds me a lot lately of you know past mistakes and past sin and you know the enemy never forgets but god does god will erase it like it never happened you stop today and you start showing your children a new you whatever age they're at they may not they may not believe it at first they may not understand it at first they may not it may seem like they're not even noticing at first trust me they're noticing and they will notice more and it will have the proper effect on them eventually in God's timing. So we need to practice what we preach and do what we say we will do. Proverbs chapter um, 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, another very famous scripture, right? You know, everybody knows this one. We always use this scripture when you're talking about fathers, children, parenting, you know, if you train up a child in the way they should go, even when they are old, they will not depart from it. Now, it may not always seem that way, right? You know, it's like, I don't, I know I didn't raise you this way. I even have a song called Whatever It Takes. And I say, you know, I, I talk about it in the first verse. How my, the first verse is, you know, my mom and dad, me explaining my mom and dad's conversation for years that they had about me. It's word for word, things that they shared with me that they were praying and saying, you know, and, you know, my mom, you know, I didn't raise him this way. Why is he acting like this? Why is he doing these things? Why is he staying out at late? She can't go to sleep because I'm coming home at one, two in the morning. I'm, I'm drunk, you know, and thinking I'm hiding it from them, but I was never hiding it from my dad. Why? Because he knew about that lifestyle from his past. So I never fooled my dad and you can never fool God. Um, my dad had a different approach. He just trusted God. Once I turned 18, he said he's in God's hands now. Well, I mean, I will definitely guide him as I, the best I can, but I can't force him. My mom was the one who was paranoid and, you know, she, she, she couldn't sleep till I came home. You know, but when you train up a child in the way they should go, when they are old, they will not depart from it. I'm living proof of this scripture. I was a prodigal son. Now, you may be still waiting on your prodigal son. You may be still waiting on your prodigal daughter. Never stop waiting. Never stop praying. Never give up. It took me for, It took me about 15 years. You know, at 36, I finally got back on track. That's how long they prayed for me, you know, from like the ages of like 20 on, you know, to 36. So you may be waiting for your prodigal son, your prodigal daughter. Don't ever give up. Don't ever lose hope. Think of me. You know, think of me when you feel like you're giving up on your prodigal son or prodigal daughter. Well, you know what? In God's timing, he brought Sam back to back to the right path for his parents. I know God's going to answer my prayer in his timing because he has a different timing for everyone. Okay? He has a different timing for everyone. And that's the difficult part for all of us, waiting on God. We're all in God's waiting room, you know, definitely. It's not fun. It's not fun. I'm not saying it is. I'm not making it li making light of it. <clears throat> I get it. I trust me. I get it. <clears throat> I hate waiting. I'm very impatient. I'm more impatient than you. I promise you. So, never give up on what God can do. Proverbs 22, verse six. Not what He can do. What He will do. We all know what He can do when He. And we all know that he will do it. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart for it. So you did your job. Now you trust God. Now maybe you're, 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 you're sitting there and you're saying, yeah, but I didn't do that. Okay? Because I didn't get saved till I was 60 and my, my children were already adults. And, 
you know, they saw a whole different side and they're not, they're not saved. They're not following God because we never grew. I didn't raise them like that. Now, you know, I'm a Christian. I've, I'm 65. I've been a Christian for five years. My children are off doing their own thing. And, you know, you may be sitting there thinking that right now, like, well, that doesn't apply to me. I didn't train them up the way that they should go. So I can't, I can't, you know, really, uh, you know, bank on that. Now you lead by example. Remember, a father leads. A father leads. And, and ladies, apply this to yourself. You know, a father leads. A mother, you know, also leads. So you start now. And you show them how real the transformation is your life. And that's showing them. You're going to win them over. You're going to win them over with your example. Because, like I said, a few minutes ago, they're noticing they're changing you. Man, I remember dad was a drunk all my life. He was a drunk up, up until 60 years old. And then he got saved. And now he don't drink no more. He don't smoke no more. He don't cuss no more. He don't yell. He don't get angry. He don't yell at mom. He don't do all these things no more. You know, him and mom, you know, their their marriage is so much better now. You know, maybe you're, you're already divorced from, from, the, from the issues of the past. But, you know, God is repairing everything now. God is repairing everything now. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. You can still be an example to your children, no matter how old they are, and win them over with your godly example. Now, you know, going back to Proverbs 22, 6, how are we training our children? What are we training? What are we training our children in? You know, are we taking them to church on Sunday, but, you know, Monday to Saturday, our houses are nothing, there's nothing Christian about it, you know? What are they watching on TV? What are they seeing you watch on TV? What are they listening to? What do they hear you listening to? How are they acting? How are you acting? You know, because they're going to they're gonna do what, what you're doing, you know? So how are we training or what are we training our children in? What are we showing them? Are we showing them that we're, that we're serious about what we do on Sundays for two hours? Are we serious about that? We, we go to church for two hours, um, if, if even that in a lot of churches. Um, but that's just routine. That's just that's just tradition. That's just checking a box, you know, every Sunday. How serious are we? Do we carry it over to home? Once again, this is not about perfection. This is about practicing what we preach, okay? It doesn't make you perfect. It just means that you're serious. You can be serious. You can show your children you're serious about God and not be perfect. You just don't practice sin. You just don't live in sin. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. But there is a difference between sinning by nature and practicing sin, we should never practice sin, meaning be comfortable with our sin. Our sin should make us miserable, like David. S David, King David, hated sin. God hates sin. Sin separates. You know, this, this is just me, you know, going off, you know, and taking from everything that I've read and everything that I've learned, you know, over these past two and a half years. You know, you know, God hates sin. David hated sin. That's why David was a man after God's own heart, even though he made so many mistakes. We don't see David making the same mistake over and over, and we see how much David hated his sin. It made him miserable. Does your sin make you miserable? If it don't, you've got a problem. That's what I always say. If your sin don't make you miserable, you've got a problem. If you're comfortable with it, you've got a serious problem. But if it drives you nuts and it makes you sick to your stomach, and it makes you cry, and it makes you it makes you hate it. You're on the right path. You're on the right path. Okay. And if it if it makes you feel all those things, you won't be running to sin. You'll be fleeing from sin. If that's how you feel, you'll be fleeing. If you feel miserable in sin, you will naturally flee from it. You will do everything you can to avoid it because you can't hate sin but run to it. That's an oxymoron. That don't make sense. Now we go to Deuteronomy. And I didn't put this one in, so you can flip there if you want, or you can write it down. It's an easy one to find, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book of the Bible, chapter 11, verses 19 through 21. You can go there quick. I'm giving you time while I ramble. Or you can write it down. And it says, you shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house. What are we talking about as we sit in our house? And when you are walking by the way, what are you talking about as you're just going about your day? And when you lie down and when you rise, 
you, are you getting a picture here? And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall write them on your doorpost of your house and on your gates that, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. Deuteronomy 11, 19 through 21. So what are we talking about at home? What are we doing at home? You know, what are we talking about in our cars with our children? What kind of conversations are we having? What do they hear us saying? What kind of music do they hear us listening to? Um, um, how do they see us talking to other people on the road? You know, um, you know what, what, when you when you lie down and when you rise, clearly we're, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, an obsession and we're talking about making things clear of who we serve and what we do in our home. And we write them on our doorposts and on our gates that the days of our children may be multiplied. So that's what I get from that scripture, you know, an obsession with the things of God and, and, and making it very clear, making it very clear how this house is ranked. Okay. In this home, we don't do this in this home. We don't do that. And we don't say these things and we don't talk that way. And we, we put scripture, you know, you know, uh, you know, I'm talking in general, not, 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 I'm not talking about my, my, oh yeah, I got, you know, this is what we do in this home, making it very clear to our children. In this house, we serve the Lord. And until you're 18, you've got no say. As my dad used to say, you've got no voice. You've got no voice. You've got no voice. You know, you, you've got no voice till you're 18. Then when you're 18, you've got a voice. But in this house, this is the way we do things, okay? So you're 18, you think you're all big and bad. Well, this is my home, and you're going to do what I say in my home. And if you don't like it, there's a door. And we hope it don't come to that, you know? But, you know, my dad used to always say, you don't have a voice. He even told my brother-in-law, you don't have a voice until you marry my daughter. So second I got married, he's like, I've got a voice. And my dad was like, yeah, but it's still lower than mine. You know, it's still lower than mine. So, you know, what are we teaching? What are we showing? What are we talking about at our home? What are we talking about in our cars? You know, I'm not a perfect dad, obviously. Like I've already said today, I've made a million mistakes that I wish I could take back. But all I can do is never do them again. Never do them again. Um, we make the same mistakes every day. Like some people would say I read the Bible too much. Some people would say that I study too much the Bible. Some people would say that I post too many of these uh, Bible studies. You're not spending time with your children. Um, you know, you, you, you're not, you're, you're, your first ministry is your, your family, right? That's what a lot of people uh, uh, say when they want to, um, when they want to maybe attack something. And it's like, obviously your first ministry is your family. I know that. But see what people what people fail to realize is what well, this all goes back to assumption. Assumption is the lowest form of knowledge. Like I said throughout all my videos, this video is not live. Breaking news. I'm recording this and I sometimes I record them several days ahead of time. Now I'm, I'm doing it today on Friday, but you're going to watch it and I'm going to watch it with you, you know? So you're, you're listening to me talk right now and I'm listening to me talk right now because I'm watching it with you. I, I did this earlier. So I, there's plenty of time in the day. There's plenty of time in the day. People will say, people will say, um, you know, oh, uh, you know, shouldn't you spend more time with your family? How do you know I don't spend more time with my family? <laughs> well, we, just because you see two to three of these pop up on your Facebook feed a week doesn't mean I'm not spending time with my family. There, there's been days where I'm off on Mondays and my, my son's at school, my wife's at work. So what do you think I do all day? One Monday, I kid you not, I recorded three videos back to back to back. And I scheduled them for later on in the week. You know, so there's you got to take advantage of technology. You know, I was, I was, I was, um, I was home, you know, I, I was home alone. And I took advantage. So, you know, I'm leading by example is what I'm doing. I'm leading by example. You know, I, 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 my, my wife just got off of work and I'm going to have to let her, I'm going to have to respond to her text message. Uh, she asked me if I wanted Wingstop for dinner. 
And it, when she watches it, she's going to laugh so hard. There, it's done. Technology is wonderful. I love technology. So I'm leading by example. I want my son to catch me in godly excellence. I heard it put in a video once, um, you know, a, a motivational video, um, great motivational video. The guy was saying was, was wonderful. Um, he was a great example of a, of, a, of a great father. I'm sure he was a Christian. I'm sure he was a believer, but the, but the way he was talking, you could tell in people, but it wasn't a Christian video is what I'm, what I'm getting at. So it was just a motivational video. And he talked about his father, how his father worked his butt off and he wanted his sons to catch him in excellence. And they grew up to be so much more successful than their father ever was. Meaning they didn't they didn't work hard. They got a, they got an education. They got degrees, so they didn't have to get up at you know three four in the morning every day and go to work and you know and have that kind of life. You know that's my you know that's my life. You know I I I, mean, I don't have it hard, but you know I work in a warehouse. You know, but this this man was setting an example for his for his sons, and he said he wanted them to catch him in excellence, and they did. They grew up to be very successful very good men like i said you can tell this this guy was a christian you could just tell he was a believer he was a good man you know and you can just tell these things so we what i am trying to do is now have my son catch me in godly excellence i want him to catch me i want him to see man dad loves to read the bible dad loves to study the bible dad loves to do bible studies for anybody who will listen Anybody who will listen, dad loves the things of God. I want that to rub off on him. Trust me, I'm aware of my son. I'm aware of my wife. I'm not so caught up in my own personal walk with, with Christ, this holy roller Jesus freak who, you know, who, you know, got my, you know, bubble around me. You know, not even my family can get inside. It's not, it's not the case. You know, my dad, he always apologized to me growing up for not being a better father. It drove me and my sister nuts it drove us nuts we'd always say what are you talking about what are you what are you what are you what are you, what are you talking about you wish you were a better father he's telling he told us that up till the very end and we don't go what are you what are you what are you what are you and that's not a glitch i'm doing that on purpose what are you what are you talking about you're the you were the greatest father yeah we drive each other we're the benitas family we fight like cats and dogs we're all you know, my dad was stubborn. He made my mom, he made my mom a pit bull, just like him. And don't let my mom fool you. She's a pit bull, man. She's a pit. We're not Chihuahuas just because we're short. My dad was a pit bull. He made my mom a pit bull. I'm a pit bull. My my sister Faith is a pit bull. Okay, the four of us are pit bulls. We're not Chihuahuas. We are pit bulls. Pit bulls ain't big dogs. They're just you know, built, you know, and they're not tall unless they're mixed with a bigger dog, but we're pit bulls, you know, and he, he, and he was the, he was the, the, the king pit bull, like that big pit bull you see on Instagram, Hulk, he was that pit bull, you know, and um, he always apologized, you know, for being, for not being a great father, like, what are you talking about, man, you were the greatest father I could ever have, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I wouldn't trade you in for uh, for any father, obviously. And now I find myself feeling the same way. You know, I find myself feeling the same way. Um, never feeling like I'm doing enough. I'm always feeling like I'm coming up short. You know, how do I do this with my son? And then, you know what? That that's probably a good way to feel. We should never feel like, no, I'm doing enough. We should always feel like I'm not doing enough. I got to be a better godly example to my son to my daughter you know i've got i've got to do better we should never get complacent that's a good thing good thing to good thing to feel and now i understand what my dad was saying um we should never feel like i'm a great dad no i can do better i can do better you know how do i do this how do i push my son without pushing him away something i've taken from reverend um pastor elias flores senior uh, I know he don't like to be called senior, but I'm just emphasizing who I'm talking about. Um, you know, he's talked to me about that, you know, off and on, you know, not pushing, not pushing, you know, not necessary to me, but like how he never liked that. You know, he's not telling me don't push your son. He's just telling me how he never liked that, you know, you know, people being pushy 
with their children. Just let them, you know, pray, you know. So how do I push my son without pushing, you know, him away, you know. And I, I think I do an okay job, you know, and I, I can always do better. Um, you know, at times I see the transition in my son and it begins to worry me, it begins to worry me. He's a great kid. You know, don't get me wrong, but sometimes he just, he doesn't seem interested, you know, and he's 12, one on 15. So it's like, you know, he's, but he's a great kid and I'm blessed. And he's getting to that age where I started struggling, you know, and keeping things to myself. So, um, that I dealt with for well over 20 years. Um, so I'm watching, I'm watching. And I'm like, you know, I'm like that. I'm like that, you know, monitoring everything, you know, um, and I'm blessed. He's a great kid. He's a great kid. Um, man, but I'm preparing myself for whatever may come because, you know, the enemy works triple time, like I said. Um, so that I wonder how I will respond to my son's prodigal era. <laughs> not not saying it's absolute, just, you know, if he, you know, he doesn't have to have one. I'm, I'm, I don't want him to ever have one, but if he did, how will I respond? You know, on one hand, I will understand, you know, because I went through it. On the other hand, I'll be extremely concerned, you know, when thinking of mine and what what I what it led me to. You know, I think of Job. I think of Job. And um, go to Job, you know, chapter 1, verse 4, four and 5. You can write that down or go there if you're quick. Um, listen to Job as I wind down because I'm long-winded. And like I said, I don't have a lot, but. I'm just long-winded. Job 1, verses 4 and 5. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did continually. Sounds like my dad always praying for me. And now it sounds like me always praying for my son. This was something that Job did continually. He continually prayed for his children. I know my father and my mother continually prayed for me for many years. And I will continually pray for my son that he will stay on the right path and never venture off too far, um, you know, Things, things happen, unfortunately, you know, and, and you know, we're, no one's perfect. But I, I pray to God that he never goes off um, on a detour like I did, you know, especially for as long and hopefully not for a, a, any amount of time. You know, I say I just hope he deals with normal stuff, man, normal stuff, because my stuff wasn't normal and it was far too long. Um, a father never stops praying for his children. A father never stops praying for their children. Or a mother, you know, for you ladies who stayed with me on this. Um, a godly father prays continually for their children. A godly father says the buck stops here. It's my responsibility. It's up to me. It's not up to, the, to my wife. It's not up to their mother. It's not up to their grandparents. It's not up to the state. It's not up to the school. It's not up to the church. It's not up to an uncle or an aunt. It's up to me. The buck stops here. I'm the man. I'm the father. The buck stops here. And a godly father accepts responsibility. He doesn't pass the buck. He doesn't shift blame like Adam, shifting the blame to Eve, and then Eve shifting the blame to the serpent. You know, well, what had happened was, you know, that kind of that kind of conversation. A godly father practices what he preaches. And preaches, preaching isn't necessarily speaking at your children, but rather your walk. That's your preaching. That Sometimes that's the only preaching that you can do, your walk, your daily routine. You're a living testimony. That's your preaching to them, showing them what dad is, what dad is doing. Maybe you've always done it. Maybe you're just starting it. You show your children the change in you. You don't have to preach at them. You don't have to turn them off. You don't have to push them away. Just show them. Just show them. They may roll their eyes. They may seem to not notice. But trust me, they notice. They know dad is serious about God and practices what he preaches. 
A godly father leads by example. He shows his children the way. And a godly father knows that God will answer his prayers not a second too late. Like I said, it's been an emotional day. A godly father knows that God will answer his prayers and he won't be a second too late. You're gonna you may be praying, you most likely will be praying for your children for many years. That doesn't mean God is late. Remember, like I said earlier, God has a set and appointed time for each and every one of us. My dad prayed for me for 15 years easy. He prayed for me for my whole life, but during that time, you know, being a prodigal, a godly father knows that God will not answer his prayers a second too late. He knows God will answer. A godly father knows that God will answer his prayers. And when he does, he'll be right on time. He'll be right on time. So, you know, I, I pray you fathers, uh, you men, because even if you're not a father, you're going to be. You're going to be one day. I pray you, all you men got something out of this. I pray all you ladies got something out of this. You know, you, you, maybe maybe, uh, maybe your, your, your father wasn't a great example. Maybe he's not here no more. So what does that mean? It starts with you. It starts with you. Just because you didn't have a great example to look to look up to doesn't mean you can't be that great example to look up to. It doesn't matter what your situation is. God can fix any situation. And God can turn it all around for good. So you may be at the end of this video going, yeah, well, I didn't have a godly father. You know, I didn't have that great example that you had. So that means it starts with you. Because guess what? It started with my dad. It started with my dad. My dad got saved first. Then his whole family came and got saved, including his father. So it started with my dad. So we can start with you. So don't don't think that because you didn't have a godly example. Well, I'm, I'm screwed. You know? <laughs> because... I didn't have a godly example. No. It can start with you. And you can break that generational curse that my father broke in his life and start over. And it starts with you. So I thank you guys for watching. You know, this was my dad's birthday. What better topic to talk about than my dad and, you know, give a Father's Day um, type, you know, Bible study um, two months late. <laughs> June, July, August, yeah. So, you know, but you know, you know, there was a there was a meaning, there was a purpose, and why I didn't do it at Father's Day on my channel. So, um, I, I thank you guys for for listening. God bless you all. I love you, Dad. Uh, can't wait to see you again. Um, you made an impact not just in my life, but in so many so many men's lives over the years. Um, we love you, and um, we, we just we just can't wait to see you again, and uh, hopefully that's soon. And hopefully God comes back like tomorrow. Um, I hear Russia and uh, China are up to some funny business with currency and all that. So, you know, amen. Praise God. You've got my support. Anything to speed anything to speed things up so we can get the heck out of here. Um, but uh, that's just how I think. Um, so, you know, I, those kind of things excite me because that just means God's, you know, we're, we're living in the end times. And when the days are going faster, the years, let's get this. Without, I don't know how if, if someone will be offended by me saying this, but beam me up, let's go. You know, I don't mean it in any weird way. Just you know, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go see my dad again. But you know, obviously, I don't want to leave. You know, my wife and son and all that stuff. So let's just get this rapture going because um, I'm, I'm ready to see my dad again. You know, but until then, until then, you know, I'll keep busy like you already know. And you know, as I look at his picture, you know, right above, uh, you know. My computer, it's amazing I haven't broke down, um, but I've been able to hold it in. But love you, Dad. Happy birthday. You would have been 70 today, and I know uh, I'm making you proud, and uh, God bless you all. Um, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.